Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar, Isolator Misconceptions Debunked. This webinar will be presented by Berkshire Sterile CEO and co-founder Sean Kinney. This event will be recorded and short, shared for your convenience. If you are excited for this event, consider joining our June webinar, A Roadmap to Expedited Fills, where we will be offering tips to prevent falling off the quality cliff. Berkshire Sterile has recently filled four COVID-19 treatments, two of which were filled in less than four weeks from the initial contact with the customer. Dating this often raises eyebrows and prompts questions such as, is that even safe? In this webinar, we will discuss how we were able to expedite safely and in compliance with FDA regulations. We will describe the fill finish process that you should expect at any sterile fill finish CMO and explain what can and cannot be expedited. We also include a list of questions to ask potential CMOs before you start your expedited fill and several tips for what you can do to get the best outcome. This webinar is helpful to any company that is deciding between sterile fill finish CMOs or is currently within a project with one. Now presenting today's webinar is to the current CEO and co-founder of Berkshire Sterile Manufacturing, a state of art facility using flexible fillers within isolators. Our speaker has both seen and contributed to the evolution of sterile manufacturing. He has worked with all types of equipment and methods and has a deep understanding of their differences. So without any further ado, I will be handing you over to our speaker, Sean Kinney. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. And thank you all for joining us today. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the takeaways that I hope you'll get out of this webinar today. First of all, I hope you'll understand why uh, after this that isolator-based filling is the future of sterile filling processes. And that you'll see what the advantages are of isolators for not just the CMO, but also for you, the client. And then I hope to share with you how Berkshire Sterile Manufacturing has solved several isolator-based sterile filling challenges. So I'd like to start a little bit with the evolution of sterile manufacturing from open clean rooms to open wraps, closed wraps, and finally isolator systems. In the early 1980s, when I began my career in the pharmaceutical industry as an operator in sterile filling, this is pretty much what a state-of-the-art clean room looked like. Uh, filling took place in a large grade A laminar flow space. Operators, were sterile gowned, the equipment was open in the same area, there was not even shrouding around the filling equipment. Now you can see here this does have shrouding in the early days of filling, in the 80s when I was doing filling in a fill suite, there was no shrouding around the equipment at all. The room and non-product contact equipment was sanitized by hand with wet chemical agents, yielding a three to four log reduction of the microflora. The only thing separating the product and the personnel were sterile gowning and laminar airflow. Great dependence upon gowning, gowning technique, personnel performance, and aseptic techniques was required. Personnel and surfaces were plated after filling. No growth was desired, but it was not unusual to find growth on some personnel plating. By the mid-1990s, when I purchased a state-of-the-art syringe filler, the clean, clean room looked much like this. Not much had changed from the traditional clean room except shrouding was being put around the filling equipment. This is known as an open wraps, a restricted access barrier system. The doors were closed during routine operations, providing separation between the operators and the filling, but doors were open for setup and interventions. Still the same methods of cleaning, Sanitizing, gowning, plating, and the same dependence upon operator techniques and performance was required. This is certainly better than traditional clean room, but still a lot of room for improvement. Today's systems, closed wraps and isolators are becoming much more common. Both use basically a sealed box to perform sterile operations in. The main difference is that the closed wraps are typically sanitized with doors open or closed, but with traditional chemical wet sanitizing agents, yielding a three to four log reduction of microflora. Whereas isolators are sanitized by sterile gases such as vaporized hydrogen peroxide, and they yield a six log 
or larger reduction of microflora. Closed drabs required sterile gowning for operators in a grade B or in some cases grade A background. Isolators required only a grade D background and have no requirement for sterile gowning. So the sterility assurance is much better in a grade A isolator than in the other techniques that we've discussed above. And I'd like to go over some commonly cited problems or uh, sh isolator shortcomings with you. The first of which is it's more expensive than a traditional clean room. We'll talk about the perceived weaknesses of vapor hydrogen peroxide, including its effect on product, uh, occluded surfaces, and long cycle times. We'll talk about how difficult it is to validate a VHP process inside an isolator. And then we'll talk about the perceived inflexibility of isolators. So starting off with more expensive, it's true. It's considerably more expensive to put in an isolator-based filling system and validate it than it is a traditional clean room. However, many studies have shown that over time, the operational benefits of an isolator technology are so great that uh, within five to 10 years, it more than pays for itself and actually becomes less expensive than traditional clean room. You have to consider there's no sterile gowning. There's considerable cost with sterile gowning. And the, you also have to consider the impact upon operator comfort. Operators gowned <clears throat> in sterile gowning inside a traditional clean room have goggles on, they have sterile gloves, they have a hood, face mask, and they tend to be <clears throat> quite warm, very uncomfortable, and can sweat. And when sweating, they're shedding microorganisms into the environment around them. There's no sterile gowning training or requalification required in typical isolator technology. Only a grade D background is required. Of course, you're in a grade A area here in a traditional clean room. Beyond that is a grade B environment. Outside the isolator is just a, day, a grade D background. The grade A area is smaller than required uh, in a large, uh, typical traditional clean room. And one thing to consider is that typically are fewer excursions and quality costs with a grade A isolator than you have in a traditional clean room. Uh, there's a lot of personnel monitoring that takes place. There would be uh, uh, occasionally hits from fingertips that very, very rarely happens, if ever, in an isolator. So there's a lot of excursions and deviations, quality costs that one uh, saves, and less plating and EM sampling and testing. So in conclusion, it is more expensive initially to set up an isolator-based clean room than it is a traditional. But over a period of several years, the isolator technology will be considerably less expensive if you consider in all of the operational costs. So let's talk about the weaknesses of vapor hydrogen peroxide, or those perceived weaknesses. It is well known that vaporized hydrogen peroxide can put residues on product surfaces. So what we need to do is ensure that we do a thorough aeration to less than one part per million vapor hydrogen peroxide or lower. We have some customers that specify they want less than 300 parts per billion in the isolator before their product is exposed. That can be done just by extending the duration of the aeration time until you achieve the level that's required. And we do not uh, expose any primary containers, stoppers, vial syringes, or cartridges to vapor hydrogen peroxide for that just that same reason. Occluded surfaces. Proper planning and design can eliminate these concerns. Anytime you have two surfaces that are mated together, you're not going to be able to get the sterilant or the sanitizing gas, the vapor hydrogen peroxide in between those to sanitize the surfaces. So in our practice, what we do is we uh, sterilize all of the containers, uh, all of the parts that are used in the isolator and hang them from the top of the isolator, leaving enough space in between them that the sterilizing gas, the vapor hydrogen peroxide can get in there and sterilize those surfaces. And then any large heavy items like a vibratory bowl would be placed on rollers inside the isolator to lift them up off the floor so the sterilant gas can get underneath and make sure that we get all surfaces sanitized. 
Now, long VHP cycles. In the early days, isolators and vapor hydrogen peroxide cycles, the cycle times were very long, sometimes in excess of eight hours. So, of course, a wet chemical sanitization with a three or four log reduction were preferred over these long cycle times. But as the technology has improved and we get better understanding of vapor hydrogen peroxide, uh, cycle times have come down dramatically. Today, cycle times are one to four hours from beginning to end. That is from the time you press the start button until the time the aeration falls down below one part per million. The cycle times that we typically see here at Berkshire Sterile Manufacturing with our isolators are two and a half to three hours with better than a six log reduction of microbes. So why wouldn't you change a two and a half hour cycle with a six log reduction of microbes for the wet sanitization that it would take to do the same isolator with only a three or four log reduction? The time is about the same now. Now closed drabs versus an isolator, what is the difference between that? They may look similar in the design of the equipment but isolators are far more robust. A closed RABS system, again, typically uses a wet sanitization process inside the isolator manually to sterilize or sanitize the surfaces of everything inside the isolator, uh, inside the closed RABS, excuse me. An isolator uses a sterilant gas such as vaporized hydrogen peroxide. So what's the big advantage here? If you had a thousand spores inside your isolator or RABS, a three log reduction would give you a thousand remaining spores from a starting of a million. A four log reduction would give you a hundred. A six log reduction means there's just one spore that would be remaining inside the isolator. So you get a hundred to a thousand fold better sanitization using vaporized hydrogen peroxide versus a wet sanitizing agent, which is why you'd want to use vaporized hydrogen peroxide in an isolator system rather than using a closed RABS. Now, some people have complained about how difficult it is to validate uh, VHP systems inside isolators. In our experience, that's not been the case. Uh, we generally find it's necessary to do trial runs to determine the amount of hydrogen peroxide needed in order to get the levels of vaporized hydrogen peroxide necessary to do the sanitization. And then we'll do distribution studies with chemical indicators such as the stereotherm shown here inside the isolators to show that we have a uniform even distribution of vaporized hydrogen peroxide throughout the chamber. We'll perform empty chamber runs with biological indicators to show that we do have a greater than six log reduction of Geobacillus sterothermophilus. And then we'll do three full chamber runs with biological indicators. So proper design of VHP systems is really required in order to uh, have a system which can be validated. The distribution and plumbing needs to be optimized and you need good measurement systems for the vaporized hydrogen peroxide inside the chamber. We have found that 650 to 750 parts per million of VHP for approximately 30 minutes is adequate for a six log reduction of Geobacillus sterothermophilus spores. And BSM has isolators from three different manufacturers. Each took a slightly different approach to the VHP process, but all three have been successfully validated. You can see on the lower left here, we have a germ-free isolator. Uh, this is where our small manual line is housed. Uh, we validated that to a six log reduction of Geobacillus sterothermophilus. We have a multi-chamber Fetagari isolator here with our semi-automated line. Uh, we were also successful in validating that to a six log reduction of Geobacillus sterothermophilus. And we have an ICS isolator here, which we use as a aseptic formulation isolator. Okay, also, the, one of the shortcomings has been the inflexibility with isolators. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time on that and show you how we've overcome this perception of inflexibility. 
Uh, first, I'd like to show you our manual line. This is a germ-free isolator. It's designed with one rapid transfer port and multiple one and a half and three inch sanitary connections uh, to allow us to get lines in and out of the isolator. Uh, this takes about two and a half hours for the VHP process from beginning to end. Again, we hang all of the parts that are gonna be used, all the plates and everything from the ceiling of the isolator and run the VHP process. This is validated for filling vials, syringes and cartridges up to 5,000 units each. So that's a fairly flexible system if you can fill all of those different containers with this one isolator system. Our semi-automated filling line contains four isolators, chamber one, two, three, and four. Three RABS systems. The, each of these RABS is producing a, is a protecting, excuse me, a mouse hole that is used either for the introduction or exit of materials from the isolator. So we have a RABS here to pass in nested RTU containers. We have a RABS here for the exit of vials through the capping system and then out into the uh, clean room. And then we have an exit here for completed uh, syringes, cartridges, and empty nests to go out. Uh, we also have an integrated lyophilizer right here, and we have a depyrogenation oven, which is fully integrated with this. The bulk vials are processed inside our depyrogenation oven inside stainless steel trays. So the vials are washed, loaded into stainless steel trays, put on a trolley, pushed into the depyrogenation oven where the depyrogenation cycle takes place. If the cycle is successful and the isolator has been successfully uh, sanitized, the operators are able to push a button and pneumatically open the door and then pull the cart with the completed uh, depyrogenated vials off into this chamber one. They get then pushed back onto a storage trolley here. The cart can be pushed back into the depyrogenation oven, the door closed, and another cycle can be started. Operators then will pull the storage trolley forward and then take the trays one at a time and pass them into the flexible filling system. And we'll show you some of that on the next slide here after we go through a little bit of the detail. So this isolator was designed for a very high degree of flexibility. Uh, you can see a movie up here in the upper right hand corner showing filling of vials and syringes uh, within the same system. The containers that we're able to process inside this isolator are vials 2 through 100 ml, both ready to use and bulk, syringes 0.5 ml, 1 ml, 1 through 3 ml, and 5 ml, and 3ml cartridges, plus we have done custom containers inside this isolator. We also have an aseptic formulation chamber. This chamber here, chamber three, can be used for aseptic formulations if it's necessary. We have an automated XY filler, which is here. You see that in the movie here. Right now we're filling some vials. Now this is showing the same filler filling syringes. And we've done five day long media fills uh, to demonstrate that we can maintain control and run this isolator for up to five days. We've never had a positive media unit in any of our media fills. So let's go through the flow of materials through this isolator. Bulk vials, as I said, enter from the depyrogenation oven, get pushed back onto the storage trolley, get picked up tray at a time, put onto the XY filler. When that's completed, they're put into the next chamber, chamber three. The vials then, uh, if they're liquid, are denested, and then put single file into the capper where the Genesis capper resides in a uh, laminar flow RABS unit uh, that has grade A quality air. And the empty trays then exit through the mouse hole down at the end of this chamber. RTU containers enter through a RABS system through chamber one and into chamber two where the filling takes place. As they're passed in through each of these chambers, one layer of wrapping is removed. Then if they're vials, uh, they're denested, and then the capped vials come out here. Syringes and cartridges will get passed out. They're completely sealed at the point after they're finished in chamber two here. They go out through this RAB system over here. The lyophilized product 
can, can the vials can come in either through the RAB system if they're RTU or through the depyrogenation oven. If they're bulk, they'll go onto the filling system, get filled, pass through chamber three into chamber four where they're loaded into the lyophilizer. Once the lyophilization cycle is completed, the vials are passed back to chamber three and go through the capping system uh, as you see here. Now also coming in 2021 is a new integrated filling line that's in uh, manufacture, it's in production right now. It will have lyophilization capability for up to 30,000 10 ml vials. It will have the ability to do RTU and bulk vials. We'll be able to complete liquid fills of up to 50,000 units in 20 hours. We'll have a wide variety of containers that we're able to uh, accommodate on this line, 0.5 ml syringes, 1 ml long, 1 through 3 ml, and 5 ml. Vials from 2 through 50R, cartridges, 3 ml, and custom containers. There'll also be a chamber in there where aseptic formulation could be performed if necessary. And we've designed a capping system to have a maximum of 12,000 units per hour so we could unload a full lyo cycle in about two and a half hours. The decon, we've added a decon chamber to this for RTU introduction. We did take a look at VHP, but ruled that out due to residual uh, product, uh, residual VHP on the units. We did uh, briefly look at flash steam sterilization, but it seemed too complicated. Uh, we selected Pulse Light uh, Clarinor system uh, for the decon chamber, uh, and the the system will have robotic handling, which removes the operator interaction and adds the flexibility to add to uh, handle bulk vials, which I'll show you in just a minute. Uh, it will have 100% non-destructive IPC capability, uh, an automatic EMA LIO loading and unloading system into the EMA LIO and a Genesis capper with raised stopper detection and labeling. So a diagram of that new system is shown here. You can see there's multiple chambers to this. This is where RTU containers would be loaded in through a RABS system. They would be debagged uh, <clears throat> in this system here. And after debagging, the uh, robot then will push those into the Clarinor system, where the Clarinor system has a robot inside which picks the tub up and presents every side of the tub to the pulse light system to get sanitized. After that's completed, it goes into the next chamber where a robotic system will delid and de deline the RTU containers and pass them into the next chamber where they'll get loaded onto the XY table. If we have bulk vials, they'll be loaded onto a washer and depyro tunnel here and will enter into the isolator system down here where there's an accumulation table. They'll be put in single file. Uh, for filling. Uh, we have a colonar robotic filler in this system, which I'll show you a close-up of in a minute. Uh, the vials, after they're completed then, would, be, would go out single file through here, and a diverter will send them either to the lyophilizer if they need to be lyophilized, or through the capper if they just need to be capped. We have an EMA lyophilizer here with an auto load and unload. This is a diagram or a picture of the colonar filler. As I said, we're able to do bulk vials or nested uh, containers. The bulk vials would be coming from the depyrogenation oven and would be presented single file to the robotic arm here, which will pick up the vials and put them into a nest configuration. While one robot is loading a nest uh, to be uh, prepared for filling, the XY table will be filling a nest that's already been populated and then another robotic arm will be denesting vials that have just been stoppered and setting those single file to go into either the capper or the lyophilizer. If we desire to use RTU containers, the robot will pick up the whole nest, 
put that onto the XY table and the XY table will do the filling. This robot then would pick up the completed nest, put it into the tub and push that out of the isolator through a RABS system. So flexibility of isolators. Isolators can be very flexible, but it must be designed and built into an isolator. And that requires cooperation of your suppliers to fabricate and integrate their equipment into an isolator. And we've had the fortunate experience to work with these quality companies here to produce all of the lines that we've done. Uh, and we've used multiple different suppliers because what we wanted to do was to select what we felt was the best technology for each of the isolator systems we use and work with the suppliers for that. And it's a process that's worked very well for us. So flexibility overview, we have or will have three isolator lines. Two are in place currently and one will arrive in 2021. The first line is our germ-free manual line and each of our lines will be able to fill vials, syringes, cartridges, and custom containers. Our semi-automated line is a Fedigari line. We can do lyo and liquid fills on this line and we'll also be able to do lyo and liquid fills on the new sterile line. Uh, line when it arrives in 2021. We'll have the ability to do bulk vials and RTU containers, and we'll be able to perform aseptic formulations. So that concludes the talk, and we'll open this up for any questions that you may have. I want to point out that quality is never an accident. Uh, it's always the result of intelligent effort. And again, I need to thank all of these suppliers here, Clarinor, Steriline, Colinar, Fedigari, EMA, and Genesis, who have all worked with Berkshire Sterile Manufacturing to create some of the most flexible and innovative isolator-based filling systems in the world. And I want to remind you, particularly if anybody joined late and missed the opening slide, uh, please uh, visit our June 4 webinar, webinar, A Roadmap to Expedited Fills. Tips to getting your drug quickly without falling off the quality cliff.